Hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Robert Preeb, creator of the vlog Parks Are Like Icebergs. I had a 30 plus career in municipal park and park system planning that included planning, acquisition, construction, programming, and maintenance operations. In 2019, I successfully defended my PhD dissertation exploring how parks decision making occurred in Edmonton from 1960 to 2010. The goal of my vlog is to share my practice experiences and outcomes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And trust me, there were all three. I have faced, I have, however, faced most issues planners and park staff must deal with on an everyday basis. So I'm providing you what I would suggest is an informed perspective based on Northern Alberta experiences, but it's my perspective only. And um, so take, take it for what it's worth kind of thing. I call each edition of my vlog, Ice Sculptures. Today's is about investing in people, investing in human health and wellness, and invite in, and more broadly in, in investing in individual and community well-being. I'm linking the benefits of parks, recreation, and leisure off my last blog on November 14th to municipal municipal budgeting processes. I'm pleased to say that joining me today is Kelly Rudick, a long time uh, a long time municipal uh, Alberta employee, not municipal per province, but longtime Alberta resident. He owns a, he runs a consultancy called It's Logical, which his, it has, um, which is focused on priority-based budgeting. He will share a framework he uses to prioritize and municipal expenditures, not limited to parks. However, we both share the same passion for governance processes to focus on human health and well-being significant parts of which can and does occur in urban parks as well as national parks and provincial parks. So let's get started. In my last vlog, I categorized park benefits in two broad categories, physical and biological first and social and economic benefits. I'm not gonna go over the same, the same presentation because we'd be here too long, but I'll just give you a summary real quick. So trees, grasses, soils, and natural areas make our air cleaner. In urban areas, make it cooler, and it also the it also helps makes the air safer to breathe. Provides uh, diverse landscapes that ensures our plant vegetation and animal life are more resilient to disease infestation and climate change effects. Reduces stormwater flows and protects our streams and rivers and lakes particularly during extreme weather events. Parks provide places of active and passive, structured and unstructured recreation and leisure, venues for, uh, for children and adolescent to play and learn and connect to nature. Connections to individuals and groups in the community reduce stress, reduce crime, re and reduce the othering of other races and cultures, et cetera, and generally promote pro-social behavior. Property values near parks are higher, which result in increased tax revenues for governments, while parks employment in construction, programming, and maintenance are economic generators no matter who provides those services, municipal or contractors. As such, expenditures in parks are effectively a form of protective services. They provide community-wide preventative health and wellness opportunities uh, for taxpayers and community more broadly and that also help to reduce other municipal, provincial, and federal investments in roads, utility services, health care, and protective services such as police, fire, and social services. <clears throat> so next I will turn this over to Kelly. When Kelly's done, I'll come back and talk about the kind of investments that could be made in parks and parks infrastructure to help create resilient communities. Thanks for coming, Kelly. Thanks, Bob. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks for the kind words and introduction. Uh, yes, just about the same amount of time as you uh, in this space. And uh, 2019, I left a long time career with Strathcona County where we met 
uh, and started its logical and uh, been enjoying it immensely uh, since since then. Um, you mentioned budgeting, and I, I think that's where I could maybe bring the most value to this conversation in that traditional budgeting in uh, our municipal space, I think, has has largely been a very competitive environment for all of the um, different departments um, that are part of that process. And um, bringing in priority-based budgeting, I, I believe it is something that could and should be used um, a lot more broadly in our sector um, because really it, uh, it has folks asking the questions about, and you and I have chatted about this before, about our big why. Like, why does a municipality exist? And you and I are of the same mind, and many, when I talk to them about this, uh, feel the same way. We really exist to um, create and nurture those conditions for people's lives to be better. We play a very important role because we are the most intimate form of government that there is. You know, people see the services and programs that we provide on a daily basis. And sometimes they don't even realize it, whether that's driving the roads or or walking on the trails, they just they just come to to expect that, but not really question who who provides it. So priority based budgeting, like I said, um, is a it's a budgeting methodology that hasn't been used very broadly in in Canada. We were one of the first in Strathcona County, and it's been a part of my practice with uh, with its logical. Um, so if we take that for for uh, I would hope a given in, in that we we're in the we're in the game of of providing well-being. Um, it behooves us then to look at those things that we do, those programs, services, buildings, infrastructure, all of that should be looked at with that lens of well-being. How do the things that we do move the needle on those well-being aspirations of our community and our citizens? Um, so the way we do that is ask in a very genuine way our community different questions than maybe we've asked in the past. You know, I, I can't tell you how many municipalities still ask the question around taxes. You know, what do you what do you think about your taxes, Citizen X? Well, they're too high. I want to pay less, but I want everything that you're giving me now and I want more. So if we know the answer to that question, and I don't think we should be asking that question, it's it's a given. Maybe we need to ask different questions around that well-being concept. So what do you feel the municipality should be doing more of to create those conditions of well-being um, returns for you as a citizen? And it's really asking the same question, but in a different way. So. Once we determine a, in, in a more genuine way what it is that the community desires as far as well-being, what we do to do to provide that return, and by by looking inwardly at what we actually do, I'm talking about actually scoring and ranking these things. So ask ourselves, you know, some tough questions about is it moving the needle on these things that that the municipal that our citizens want. And if we're genuine about that, that introspection, we'll get a we'll get a ranking order of the things that we do. And you and I both talk about priorities. And the definition of a priority is something takes precedence over something else. Well, if we have this order of of value, naturally something is more valuable than something else. And Budgeting should be about, you know, turning the dial up or down on those things that bring the most value rather than just taking everything we do year after year and trying to do it all, but trying to do more. So when we ask those questions, again, back to the well-being idea, um, there is going to be um, things that we do that have different ranking uh, as far as what they bring in as far as well-being return. and so we should be looking at everything we're doing um, from a well-being perspective. And I have a strong uh, bias towards um, everything recreation related has those numerous impacts like you're talking about, whether those be parks, trails, 
um, you know, everything, everything from a social aspect, to health benefits, uh, environmental benefits, um, you're very articulate at sharing those. But from my perspective, the highest, um, asking those higher order questions about priorities and how they show up in budgeting processes and strategic planning, um, I would I would think we'd be doing ourselves favors when we ask from a lens of of well being. Cool. Um, that that's that's quite interesting. Uh, what, what, you know, in the in the time that I was working, um, we were never very good at deleting things, but we were always really good at adding things to do. Kind of <laughs> so what's priority? Um, and you know, city of Edmonton's going through a process right now with uh, it's going to pool where they're shutting it down because it's falling apart and and they want to build something else somewhere nearby which is great but there's a, a lag so it's always difficult to withdraw services once you have them kind of thing so right well bob with that um i think one of the things that helps out is when you have a real good pulse on demand and you and I talked very specifically recently about a, a very specific example in the community that you and I live. I've been seeing more pickleball courts uh, <laughs> pop up. And if I was looking at that from a priority based budgeting lens, what you might ask at the same time is when you're recognizing that demand increasing for pickleball, it's likely that demand is decreasing somewhere else. And for me, it, it seems like we've made that decision. Um, based on some data that, um, you know, demand for tennis is kind of waning. So I'm seeing in our community that there's some retrofitting of tennis courts to allow for pickleball to be played. So um, that's a classic example of a priority based budgeting decision in that we've kind of reallocated or reused a piece of infrastructure to increase the value that we're getting out of it, um, asking those questions or being mindful of demand uh, from our citizens and, and from a well-being perspective, the more people that are using the infrastructure, the better. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I I was three years with Strathcona and most the other almost 30 years with the city of Edmonton. And I smaller communities seem to be able to pivot a little quicker than um, the large communities like Edmonton. Uh, there's just so many more people to talk to kind of thing. So many more groups. So there's a, you know, they, so there's some uh, challenges there depending on the size of your organization. And to some extent, the sophistication of some of the groups you're dealing with because they're they're large groups and they organize quite well. I just, uh, I'll just uh, do a little riff on related to this, related to, uh, to add a little color to what you're talking about based on my experiences of Ed in Edmonton, as well as my studies. So um, Edmonton is a, is a growing city with a diverse population base whose needs have grown and changed. Um, parklands, are provided through the MGA for school and park uses, but how they're provided and the extent to which they're provided is truly discretionary. And as, a, as an old parky, that's very sad to me that we're not more than discretionary, but nevertheless, that's what that's reality. Um, so we tend to, uh, in Edmonton and, and, and the county as well, we tend to rely a lot on uh, not for profit partners and some for profit partners for that matter. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the costs. When we you talk, Kelly, about budgeting, what are you budgeting? So, um, the, the, so in terms of green space, so I'm going to talk about two categories green space and uh, bricks and mortar. So the cost, uh, the cost of parks, um, include, uh, Design, construction, project management. Uh, we we implied, well, not implied. In every municipality, there's a development standard that they will accept, a construction standard, and you see that when you visit different centers, you see they have different standards all over the place. Um, 
Edmonton has adopted LEED standards uh, in their facility, and I think the county may have too, and there's different levels of LEED standards. And they are, I, I love them and, they're, and I support them, but they do cost more money. Uh, Edmonton has um, public art standards in their, in their rec facilities or in any large public expenditure, they have to include uh, public art. So we've, that's been added in recent years, both lead and art. Municipal operations include all kinds of, you know, field and gymnasium bookers, grass cutters, weed trimmers, arborists, play, guys who fix playgrounds and uh, park equipment. There's people who meet, greet you at the door of rec facilities or sometimes in the parks. Uh, there are fitness techs, snow removers, ice flutters, um, you know, there's a long list of people that are employed that all have a cost there. And, and uh, sometimes yeah, on green space, you have private contractors who you might pay to run a program. Sometimes it's municipal staff. Any municipality has management staff. Kelly and I were part of management staff. Um, that, that's a reality. Apparently not in Alberta Health, but we won't go there. Um, community, and then there are community facilitators um, that work with the community because we are, in, particularly in, in Edmonton and green space, we work, we relied on the community a lot. So when we start establishing how we're going to build our parks, and and in this case, how we're going to budget to build them. So who does what? Now we we can't. Possibly, Edmonton uh, and most municipalities have decided that they can't possibly do everything, all, all the green spaces themselves. So in Edmonton, for example, they have a policy that says the base level, and they define what base level is. The base level is, is municipal. They have a community shared aspect that is in Edmonton is like um, playgrounds, skate parks, water, water play features kind of things. Those are shared. And then there are enhanced uh, expenditures that the, that they will not fund, that the city will not fund and the community funds on its own. Um, so um, in terms, so so there's a, there be, be, in ter when we put money, when we were putting money in budgets, it's for those levels of expenditures and all those are locally defined. What Strathcona did was different than Edmonton and Calgary may do something different. And that doesn't mean Edmonton is doing it better or worse. It just means it's the, it's the local culture kind of thing. In terms of brick and mortars, it's almost, uh, it's a little more Straightforward, you might say most municipal facilities, uh, major rec centers are in Edmonton are, um, are municipal operations kind of thing. In part because they are they tend to be harsh operating environments and are expensive to operate. So you'll have ice, aquatic, equine centers, sometimes field houses, indoor soccer, fitness centers, walking tracks, meeting rooms, commercial spaces that support. Um, a rec center like physiotherapy for old guys like me, uh, food services, equipment purchase like the running room, could even include daycare, indoor playgrounds, there's parking lots associated with them. But what each municipality does is, um, is different, what they're willing to support. And not only that, things have changed over time. And so I'll give you some examples. In recent years, Edmonton uh, libraries were not part of rec centers. They are now. Uh, that, that was enabled by changes to legislation, which I think is a great idea. I thought was a great idea. Um, municipalities have been allowed now to collect rec recreation facility fees from developers in new plan areas. I don't think Edmonton's picked up on that. I'm not sure who has. I think St. Albert may have, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, and as I mentioned before, lead construction is something that's happening now that never did before public art. 60 years ago, soccer was a European or South American sport. There wasn't a lot of people in it. Today, there's huge amounts, um, in part because hockey is very expensive. You know, people had to find other, other activities for their kids. And it's just grown exponentially in recent years with our soccer teams, uh, 40 years ago, indoor soccer in particular wasn't a thing until 
about 40 years ago, we started building them inside. Fitness centers weren't a thing. In the, we did not we did not include fitness centers. We didn't have wave pools, lazy rivers, saunas, whirlpools. They weren't part of our uh, of of our facilities, but today they've become almost an expectation kind of thing. Which there's some issues around expectation management that we have to think about when we're doing this work. Um, dog parks were not a thing 30 years ago. We didn't have dog parks in Edmonton 30 years ago. Now they are wildly popular and wildly controversial. I can tell you, I lived through a couple of them. Uh, recognition of the indigenous peoples in our park systems is something that you know has only come to the fore in the last 10 years ish kind of thing should have been done before. Natural air provision uh, protection in Edmonton wasn't a thing until the 2006, 2016 Urban Parks Management Plan that I was the project lead on. So we weren't capturing natural areas formally in policy in our park system. Um, gymnasium spaces because of the because of the Raptors gym, basketball is huge. Gymnasium spaces are growing. Aquatic aquatic facilities are growing. Interest in aquatic facilities. Dive tanks and fifty meter pools weren't really a thing and never have been, except when we had games like the Commonwealth Games, where we got them as part of the games legacy kind of thing. Well, now people now we've developed clubs and organizations that use them <laughs> so now it's be, it's becoming an expectation um and a demand um we have partnered in edmonton with the school board since 1960 to share public and private or public uh municipal uh, facilities and lands with the boards which has been a great partnership not every municipality does it but edmonton did there was a time think about minor hockey there was a time um, when minor hockey was mostly an indoor sport, uh, sorry, an outdoor sport. And then in Edmonton, we said, let's build, let's enclose some of our outdoor rinks. We called them shell arenas in the late seventies. So the Westwoods, Creston, Tip Tipton, those were all shell arenas. They weren't really intended to be full blown arenas. And now we have twin ice sheets in our major rec centers Edmonton has not historically funded new curling rinks. Well, while smaller towns do tend to have curling rinks more so than Edmonton, not, not that there aren't curling rinks in Edmonton, but they're, they're generally more community run. Um, uh, major facilities in the River Valley, which are tourist facilities, they're not budgeted in the same way. So they've had to find, they created foundations that help um, that help uh, fund the, the new amenities that they need at Fort Edmonton, Valley Zoo, whatnot. Um, so they found other ways to create some money. The major for in, in uh, we have, the city has partnered with the YMCA and YWCA on, 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 uh, aquatic, on aquatic facilities. And I'll share one last thing. Uh, there was a recent discussion at city council that kind of, kind of captures what we're talking about here um where they're they want they're building a new recreation center in west Edmonton on called lewis farms i've forgotten the name of the park site itself but it was a district park site now they want to build a rec center uh they had budgeted all out and they had a certain amount of money and then all of a sudden the costs went up as they do um with supply chain and 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 uh, inflation that's hitting everybody uh, min uh municipalities as well so they came back to council and asked and and weren't asking for money but actually came back and said we can reduce the budget by delete by basically modifying the program and the program they want to uh change is they want to make the 50 foot pool a 25 foot pool and eliminate the diving tank. Now the diving tank, the only other diving tank like of the same quality, you might say, I believe is at Kinsman. And then there are groups that have, now there's the, you know, diving, diving groups kind of thing. And they're looking for some new facilities because these, this is a, once we created the, the, the facilities then we created the groups that operate them kind of there, use them. 
So when they came to council, the council report termed the change right sizing, comparing it to other district major rec centers. And for me, <clears throat> the report and position raises some question, some weird questions, but nevertheless, the the discussion is what is one they need to have. What is a legitimate program for rec facilities? Um, should we be accommodating diving tanks and fifty foot pools, kind of thing? Uh, and you could you could do that with should should we be having fitness centers, for example, in rec centers, or can they be privately? somewhere else like planet fitness kind of thing there's all those kinds of things and generally speaking um those are the things we need to have public dialogues around you know we kelly and i are talking about budget processes so when we're approving capital and operating budgets my experience and my readings as a when i was in school um was you don't have those discussions at budget time or at council initially. You you have to sort out what's priority long before council. But nevertheless, it's it's entirely appropriate to ask what is it we want to provide. They've done this for years in uh, you know minor minor sport in, in Edmonton, for example, minor hockey. They only get so many hours per level per team. And if they want more, they pay full rate because the 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 base level is subsidized by the city kind of thing. So determining what we what municipalities want to spend on is is an important discussion to have. And and with all the financial costs impacting everybody these days, I think it's a really valuable one to have. And uh, processes like Kelly's talking about will take some of the nerdy details that I just shared and kind of help, or I'm hoping can bring some uh, perspective on what's happened in the past and where we need to go in the future. That's my story and I'm sticking to, to it. Kelly, do you have anything to add? Well, just listening to you, especially near the end there, um, you used a word that I think doesn't get talked about enough and that's value. So, we talk about budgeting it's really turned into mostly a costing exercise what are we doing today what does it cost to continue to do it where um i think we need to do really good uh, strategic planning we need to talk about what our priorities are and from a well-being perspective um, we may have to then decide uh, you know where we get the most value out of what we're willing to spend um, in a certain area. So um, for me, the, the well-being returns are usually our social health, psychological, spiritual, bringing joy. And your point, we can't be all things to all people, right? So where are we going to get the biggest bang for our buck? Um, is it a trail system that's well-defined and well-articulated, has some uh, way signage, uh, respectful of the things that you said around planning? Um, to me, um, it's hard to argue against the trail system versus, you know, plopping up these, this bricks and mortar that you talked about. Uh, we really have to think long and hard about when we make that really big decision um, and really big expenditure and think long and hard about the programs that are embedded within it. You bring up um, the 50 meter pool. We had the very same conversation in Strathcona County. And it was such a very narrow uh, group that we were making that decision for um, that I think we made a good decision and said, you know what, there's one regionally in Edmonton. We don't necessarily in this instance have to keep up with the Joneses. So we're, we're not going to, right? Um, but, you know, that brings other questions as far as, uh, you know, who should be responsible for what regionally, but, um, you know, maybe it becomes a regional conversation when there are really big expenditures that happen. Yeah, Equine is a is a similar one too, where the the county is building one now, I believe, and there has been one in one in Edmonton for some time, and there's smaller centers, uh, smaller uh, facilities as well. But 
Yeah, those are tough things to, you know, people have needs or, you know, I was in. The, I think in the last time I talked on my vlog, I talked about needs versus wants and it's really tough discussions to have, but you have to get there kind of thing because we can't, you know, taxpayers, community, taxpayers can't afford everything they may want sometimes. Um, but having said that, um, and I'll just wrap this up by saying these expenditures are not for fun per se. These are to help people's wealth, health and well-being. So if you're a trail person and I'm a trail person, you're a trail person. I love those things, but I also love going to, you know, major rec centers like Commonwealth and Sherwood Park is Millennium Place. So um, it's about scale and scope and what we can afford. So and it's all, uh, but I just want to make sure it, the intent of this is to make people understand that these are important expenditures, but you got to figure out what, what works for your community. So I will leave it at that. Do you have any final words, uh, Kelly? Nope. Just, uh, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I enjoy these conversations and, uh, if anyone out there listens and gets excited about priority-based budgeting, they can certainly uh, check out my website. It's uh, it's logical.ca, and all my contact information would be there. So appreciate it. Great. Thanks again, Kelly. And we'll see you folks soon. Bye.